And good morning, beautiful people of the center. As you heard from Chelsea this morning, our theme um, for the month is the power of awareness. So I invite you to um, become aware with me of that within you, which is witnessing your own life. And you can help that by mindfully taking a moment to check in with your body and place it in a position. Assume a position of restful alertness. Right? Sometimes in classes, people will be running from work or what other activities, and they'll get to class and they'll arrive there like this. <laughs> you know, and then that needs to unfurl, right? has to open up slowly over time. So um, you can do that, and it's nothing more um, complicated than doing a slow inventory of just how you're sitting. Am I sitting in a position that I can be in for a while? Because I notice sometimes I'll, I'll, ad, ad, I'll have habits of sitting like this that eventually cause a foot to go to sleep or something will just get stuck. And as I open up to it, then I can... Uh, dispense with having to adjust and pay attention. I can be present for what is flowing through my consciousness in a different way than if I just arrive. And then when I'm in that restful alertness, then my awareness is receptive in a much deeper way to what I usher through it. This whole... Um, month we've been, this whole year, we've been reading affirmations. Our theme has been the power of spiritual living. And I brought them along with me, the ones we've read so far, so that we can read them together in a restfully alert way to notice the difference when we practice like that. In January, we started with the power of intention. So I invite you to breathe in. And then together. Whatsoever things are just... Whatsoever things are true, and whatsoever things are lovely, I think on these things so that they grow and increase in my own life. And a breath. And then together. The real me, the inward I, is an inseparable part of the whole. It is through my recognition of this that the outer becomes as the inner and my wholeness is revealed. Followed by breath. Together. I consciously take my place as the creator of my own world. I am the guardian of my own faith. I cooperate with spirit in letting the ideas of wholeness flow through me with joyful expectancy. Followed by breath. Together. I am conscious of the spirit of joy within me. I contemplate its eternal being within me. And I grow in likeness of its beautiful expression. Followed by a breath. And this is the one we had today. I abandon myself to the realization of my unity with the whole. I identify my mind with the spirit of wholeness. I am aware of my unity with all that is. And a breath. It becomes a different practice, just giving yourself a little moment to become aware of that within yourself, which is witnessing what you're doing, so you can become single-minded. And if you enjoy that kind of practice, that's what we're going to be doing on the first Wednesday prayer, music, and meditation service coming up. There'll be a group of young people with me, and we'll do readings just like these, and it'll be interlaced with... Um, chanting in plain chant style in, in English led by Chris Fritchie. It's a wonderful way to have a midweek spiritual mindfulness practice in this exact way. It's like giving yourself a vitamin boost in the middle of the week. And you know there's something about doing it together. 
that um, amplifies the effect. It has a different effect than doing it alone. It's a wonderful time to be in community together and practice. So you won't be preached at on Wednesday. We'll practice. Yeah. So it's appropriate that this month, um, when we focus on awareness, that we have a new calendar picture. And I don't know if you know this, but as I was happily turning on the center calendar there, I found, looking at me, my own cat, <laughs> Andrew. So just in case you didn't get a calendar, I thought I'd bring him along. <laughs> this is Andrew. And the reason why I was so excited about him is because I think of him as a, the epitome of mindfulness and awareness practices. He is an icon of awareness. And what I mean by that is he can sense things like when I'm going to go away on vacation like I just recently did, he, he knows. And he starts to act out before I even pack my bags. And he starts to become very needy and he shows up and sits in places where, you know, he's not interested in sitting usually and goes, carries on like a crazy animal. Um, he also knows when I come home. He arrives in advance, he knows. And he also knows when I'm meditating. If I, if I want to call him, it's far more reliable to just sit down and meditate than it is to go and call him. <laughs> you know, he'll, just, he'll come, and he's tuned in that way, and I aspire to be like that, you know, tuned in. Without the use of any reminders, he doesn't need a reminder, he doesn't need an external message or some sort of external prompt and notification. He doesn't need a text message. He doesn't need an email to be present. He is. That's my story about him. And I aspire to be like that, you know, present. Thinking about that, I remember a message, an email message that a friend sent me in this regard. And in it, there's a picture of a family eating dinner together. And then the caption is, my phone died today, so I spent some time with the family, and they seem like nice people. <laughs> Could be. <laughs> so think of awareness as the practice of being present for life, tuned into it present for it. And guiding us this month is a classic of metaphysics, The Power of Awareness, written by an author who was just known by one name, Neville. Just a beautiful, beautiful book. It's crystal clear. And in it, there is this ongoing invitation to the reader, you and I, for us to become aware of that within us which is witnessing our own life, to look at and see our thinking, to become conscious of our feelings and everything else that is on the inside so that we can see how it is connected to the shape that our world is taking on, to see how that, that inner life is somehow interacting with the creation of outer experience. And that single idea might very well be the dividing line between those people who consider themselves to be metaphysicians and those who do not. Right there, that's it. I mean, um, metaphysicians are people who tend to be convinced that there is something going on. There is some connection between what is on the inside and what is on the outside. It's often the thing that will cause a person to stay or go in this teaching. He addresses it like this in the book, chapter 3. He says, our chief delusion, he's talking about you and I who identify ourselves as metaphysicians. Our chief delusion is the conviction that there are causes other than our own state of consciousness. There you have it. And it's the dividing line. And, you know, we don't always like it. We certainly don't always understand it. We can't seem to always explain it. And sometimes we literally cannot see the connection between our thoughts and things. But, oh, those of us who take to this teaching, we wrestle with it for our whole lives. Once we open the door into this consideration, then we spend the rest of our lives practicing to pay attention to what is in the inside. Developing that consciousness. 
And what is consciousness? Well, you might say it is awareness. That is a simplified way of describing it. Well, he describes it more thoroughly like this. Your consciousness is all that you think and desire and love and all that you believe is true and all that you consent to. Now, there is a word to pay attention to. Consent to. All that you allow. All that you agree with. Consent to. Yeah, I remember going to a leadership training a long time ago. It was all about accountability for leaders. And um, the training was focused around what to do when a stressful situation happens in a workplace or an organization and how to respond to it. And I'll never forget what the trainer advised us to do. She said, when something happens in the workplace that is stressful or challenging or wrong, um, if you can have the space in your thinking to just pause for a moment and ask yourself this question of yourself, no matter what the situation, ask yourself, how do I promote, allow, or create this? Wow. I'd never thought of that. And what a difference it made in my life. Every time now something happens, I ask first, how do I consent to this? It changes the whole dynamic. And so many times I ab was able to shift away from blaming other people when I see my fingers wrapped in the allowing of something to happen. When I allow something to happen, um, then the next time it's easy to allow it. Easier. It gets easier every time. And then very soon over time it becomes normal. And then... Because it's normal, now it's very difficult to challenge. And then very soon, I start describing it as reality. It's fixed. Which is why he says, that is why a change in consciousness is necessary before you can change the outer world. What he's talking about is metaphysics. The way of metaphysics, because the focus of metaphysics is change from the inside out. It is not an obsession with changing the outside world first. It is the obsession, you might say, of changing. It's a lifelong study of how to change the entire basis of our thinking. And not just the one time. You know, it's easy to get somewhere in your learning and think, I've done it now. I've taken the class, I've got it, I'm done, I'm good to go. No. You know, some of our long-term members, they, they take our beginner classes, as one said, I take it every three or so years, whether I need it or not, because I, I want to keep growing, and I just love that, that teachability. And another one of our long-term practitioners, our prayer practitioners, said to me just last week, she said, you know, just when I thought I had heard it all, on Easter Sunday I heard a brand new idea that opened up my consciousness, and she said, and re it reminded me that there is always another height to attain in consciousness. Always. Oh. And, and, you know, that's what the Beyond Limits class is about that we're registering for outside. It's the idea that we can go beyond the limits of wherever your consciousness has brought you to so far. Because there's another height to attain. And I think being a metaphysician and being in this teaching, it requires always being in the beginner mind. I think it requires always being teachable, always being available to expansion past what I've already accomplished. Because, oh, spiritual arrogance, oh, it's sure to keep a person stuck in their own greatness. I think about that, you know, where I am today. Well, it's a product of consciousness, as he describes it. 
It's a product of all that I think and all that I desire and all that I love and all that I believe to be true and all that I consent to and the good news of metaphysics is and that can be evolved and opened and expanded and there's the room to work. Now chapter 3 of this little book, The Power of Awareness, has a title the power of assumption, and it's the focus of our topic today. And I think when people hear the word assumption, they might automatically think of Don Miguel Ruiz and the Four Agreements, right? How many people have read that? So you know that's one of the agreements. Don't make assumptions. And it's also the textbook for the self-mastery class that I'm going to be teaching in which we examine how growing our consciousness has something to do with being aware of the role that making assumptions plays. And assumptions in, in this regard, when we talk about making assumptions, we mean when you and I think something is so, but we didn't check. We've consented to it based on circumstantial evidence. And by circumstantial evidence, I mean hearsay, word of mouth, gossip, advertising, Google search, <laughs> memory, past experience, and so on. But nothing deeper than that. We've got to a point where we believe a thing is so, whatever that thing is, and because we believe it is so, we grant it extraordinary power to shape our world. We infuse it with creative power. It becomes vested. Then the four agreements, um, the focus is on, well, the tremendous mischief, I might say, that we can cause when we take this amazing power that we have to use our consciousness and its ability to make things up without checking if we're being accurate. One of the ways we use that is to add meaning to a story so that it tells in the way we want to tell. Have you ever done that? or how we are able to add meaning to a story that was, where the meaning wasn't present. Because we don't like something that has no meaning. We will make it up. I think of consciousness or awareness sometimes as the stories I tell myself, the stories I've become fond of. One author said, everybody likes a good story, and this is her words exactly, she said, but sometimes... I find that I am no longer telling the tale. Instead, the tale is telling me. Everyone's nodding. Mm. <laughs> I'm talking about Laura McReynolds in, in a, a great short article. She tells the story of how an account of the same situation can be radically different from different points of awareness. All right, I brought it along because it's so good. Some moron wasn't looking where he was going. So I was in a terrible car accident and I was in the hospital for a month and I lost my job and none of it was my fault and now I'm never going to find a job as good as that one and my life is ruined forever. I hate the guy who did this to me. That's one version of the story. And a shift in awareness. I was in a freak car accident and spent a month in the hospital. During that time, I got a chance to see how many people really loved me and cared about me. And because I was off work for so much time, I finally broke free of a job I didn't enjoy working. Now I'm free to reinvent myself, and I'm looking forward to what happens next. Right? You know, it's such a beautiful illustration. I know life isn't always that black and white, cut and dry, but we're talking about this sense of making an assumption where we give meaning to a story or a situation when actually there are other possible meanings available at the same time. And it's not just positive thinking. It's not just denying what happened. It's a genuine interest in an alternate reality, a simultaneously valid alternate reality. And it takes a lot of courage to explore life like that. 
It takes a lot of vulnerability to undo the meaning that our stories have. Now, in, in Neville's book, he takes assumptions and he approaches it from a completely different perspective. He talks about using assumptions in a powerful, proactive, creative way. He writes about assumptions in the sense of taking something on purposefully. Like, you know, I assumed that position in the company, or I assumed the new responsibilities that with, with the job, or I assumed authority in this project. The taking on mindfully, so we can think about it in consciousness work, when I mindfully take on the way of thinking, the consciousness of the person I want to be. And using my imagination to adopt the expressions, the thoughts, the love, the, the beliefs, and everything that such a person that I would want to become would consent to. And then letting that shape my world. You know, when I learned this, I was, um, was working in Hollywood, in the movie industry. Oh man, that was a stressful environment. <laughs> And I, I, was all, I felt like I was always in a, a, a situation where decisions had to be made with not enough time and so, always so much money was always riding on every little thing. And I was really stressed out and there were all these critical decisions that had to be made in a very fast-paced environment. And I was going crazy. And I went to see a spiritual coach and he said to me, well, what do you want to be different here? And I'll never forget that, that, that um, consultation. Because I said to him, I want to, be, I want to be the calm person in this environment. That's what I want to be. I want to be the, per the one person in this crazy environment that is calm and level-headed and able to make good decisions under pressure. That's what I want. And then the coach said to me, all right. I want you to assume that you are the person who is capable of doing all that. And I want you to take that on in your imagination and trust that. And then just go about your duties as normal. In other words, I don't want you to make any other change than your assumption. I don't want you to wish that you were a better person. I don't want you to get a strategy for making different decisions. I don't want you to affirm that you're a better person. I just want you to explore in your own mind how such a person as you wish to become would show up and feel and think and be in this work environment. That's all. That's your homework, he said. It's mind work. And wow, what a difference that made. Because I'm a good student, I will do what my coach tells me to do. And so I did. And I can't tell you at what point the switch over took place. But in my time in that industry, I became known as the person who was level-headed under stress and could be counted on to follow through with good decisions in a fast-paced environment. I can't tell when I became that person, but I did. And I attribute it to this assumption that took place in mind first. You know, I had another opportunity to work in a similar way when my, my mother, a year ago, was dying. It was, it was very difficult for me to witness her rapid decline from another continent so far away, so I, I felt myself being plagued with thoughts of being um, helpless and ineffe ineffectual and having to depend on the kindness of family members that I really didn't know that very well so far away. It was a very stressful time. And I got some very good advice, similar advice from a spiritual coach who advised me very much in the same way to do some mind work. He said to me, I want you to assume the attitude of someone who knows and knows that he knows that he can make a difference no matter where he is on the planet. And I had to think about that. He was asking me to shift my awareness from doing 
something much more closer. And then he gave me some homework. He gave me some mind work to do. He said, I want you to get a notebook. And on the top of the first page in the notebook, I want you to write your mother's name. And then on the next page, write her closest relative. And then on the next page, her friends. And then all the people that you know who are associated or having anything to do with her. And then when you've got that list done, I want you to go back. And then once a day, I want you to open the first page, see whose name is at the top, and handwrite an affirmative prayer for the person whose name is at the top of the page. And then the next day, do the next page. And why handwrite? Well, I understand now. Because when I am trapped in my story and it's telling me, then my mind spins out of control. But writing a prayer down, well, it demands awareness. It is slow and it brings into focus the details of what I'm doing. And you lean further and further into the process. And he advised me, he said, I want you to write every one of these prayers with the assumption that it is the most powerful thing that is at work in this situation. I want you to assume that is so. And I did. And I can tell you I had the experience of becoming the prayer. Oh, what a difference it made for me in terms of how I held my own grief, in how I was able to let situations evolve in the way they wanted to, how I was able to accept the whole thing. I'll never forget that. To, to shift awareness, something really close, and assume the mindset that you wish to be in. He talks about it in terms of giving birth to your ideal in the book, meaning what you want to be. He says that in giving birth to your ideal, you must bear in mind that the methods of mental and spiritual knowledge are entirely different. This is a point that is truly understood by probably not more than one person in a million. So let's see if we can increase that by a few hundred today. And this is, I think, how we do it, by first understanding what is mental work. It's valid, but it is very, it's characterized by certain things. Mental work is looking at things from the outside to understand it, measuring it up, comparing it, analyzing it, defining it, and it requires concentration and planning and goal setting and action plans, all very, very good. It's different with mind work. He says, you can know a thing spiritually only by becoming it. You must be the thing itself and not merely talk about it or look at it. You must be like the moth in search of its idol, the flame. Oh, what an image. In other words, we must lean into it and be consumed by it and become one with it. And when I read that, it makes me think how different this mind work is from wishing work. Because I can wish for a healthier body. I can even affirm it without getting any healthier than my consciousness allows me. Especially if what I'm wishing for remains something out there. He says to bring a greater value of your life into being, you must assume. You must assume that you are already what you want to be. And that causes me to remember the words of my first coach, Edward. I want you to assume that you are the person you desire to be. I want you to assume that, to take it in and try it on. And I want you to go about your duties as normal. You see, he didn't advise me to go out into the world and be reckless and act in a way that was not consistent with my means or my ability. He just gave me the task in mind to explore how such a person as I desired to be would feel, think, act, and what would that person consent to. He says in the book that the most important tool we have in doing this work is imagination. He says it is the instrument by which you and I create this world. And he calls it the only redemptive power that there is. In other words, it's the only thing that can free us. And such 
is our nature, he says, that it is always optional whether or not we will use it. Now, our movement, Centers for Spiritual Living, is activated by a vision statement in which we are being invited to use our imagination all the time to see this world in a specific way. We are being invited to see a world that works for everyone, a world in which forgiveness is the norm, a world in which sharing is generous and ongoing, a world in which unity and cooperation are the standard, we are being invited to assume the ideas, the desires, the loves, the beliefs of such a person as who, who would create this world. To try that on, and then to consent to that which such a person as who would create that world would consent to to agree with and allow that which such a person as who would create this world would agree with and allow. To take on the consciousness in a work and to trust it was inevitably it will lead to instruction. Now in the weeks that follow, we're going to go further and study the role that attitude plays in a powerful awareness. And then the following week, on the 18th, we're going to study the role that acceptance plays in developing awareness. And then the following week, we're going to study the role that righteousness plays in developing a strong awareness. Righteousness. It's going to be fun. And so what I'd like to invite you to do now is to read with me again the affirmations that we started with so that we wrap this with a bow on either end. So I invite you to breathe in with me and exhale together. Whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are true, and whatsoever things are lovely, I think on these things so that they grow and increase in my own life. A breath. The real me, the inward I, is an inseparable part of the whole. It is through my recognition of this that the outer becomes as the inner and my wholeness is revealed. A breath in. I consciously take my place as the creator of my own world. I am the guardian of my own fate. I cooperate with spirit in letting the ideas of wholeness flow through me with joyful expectancy. A breath. I am conscious of the spirit of joy within me. I contemplate its eternal being within me, and I grow in likeness of its beautiful expression. A breath. I abandon myself to the realization of my unity with the whole. I identify my mind with the spirit of wholeness. I am aware of my unity with all that is. And a breath in as we exhale into a moment of silent contemplation.